we will shortly be arriving at Finsbury Park. Change here for the Piccadilly and Victoria Line. And where are you from, Lydia? I was, I was born in Peru, in South America. So were you brought up Catholic? Um, I was born a Catholic, yes, but then I lapsed for many years. I was a lapsed Catholic, and I only came back to a faith uh, nearly two years ago. So what was your upbringing like, Lydia? I was baptised as a Catholic. My family was supposedly Catholics. From my mother's side, we were... Um, my, from my mother's side, they, they were very much Catholics. They were true Catholics. You church going rosary praying Catholics. From my father's side, however, they, they weren't. So when my mother, who is from Ecuador, uh, married my dad, she sort of left all that Catholicism behind, I think. She, you know, came from a small town in, in Ecuador and she moved to Peru, to the big city in Lima. And then uh, th both of them just completely lost the faith. And so we were brought up supposedly Catholics, but not really going to Mass or anything. So, Did you receive yeah. the sacraments? I was baptised and then Holy Communion because I went to a, a Catholic school. But then when I moved to the British school in Peru, that, that was, that was secondary. it. Yes. So I, I didn't get confirmed there because it was a secular school, you know. What was your schooling like as primary? Was it like quite a traditional South American yes. little school? It was a lovely little, well it was Canadian nuns and they were very, very sweet and they were very devoted to the Blessed Virgin Mary. I got a lot of that growing up in, 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 in Lima when I was a child, you know, in my um, prep school. And you mentioned a special, like a special story with Lima. I mean, I've heard of Rose of Lima. Yes, Saint Rose. Yeah, and then also it was Saint Martin de Porres. Saint Martin de Porres, yeah, beautiful saints. Yeah, we only have about three, and uh, well, who's saint, the other one? I think he's called Saint Mat. I, I couldn't really say just in case I'm wrong, <laughs> but I think it's Matthias. And we have also a big procession in, on in the mo month of October, Lord of the Miracles, okay. Jesus Christ. Yes, so it's a huge procession, million plus, you know, people. Wow. Yeah. Well, there was this <laughs> huge earthquake in Lima, and this little place called Pachacamilla, it, it was completely, I think, it, destroyed by the earthquake. And the only thing that was standing there was this mural of the Lord of the miracles of Jesus Christ yes so from then on you know there was a procession we obviously realized it was a miraculous thing and, and and there's been a procession since then and it's a very old very old devotion and so you'd get would you get involved in that all of your childhood all of your time there or was that just a primary school sort of time you'd get involved it's like a sweet thing yeah and yeah it was definitely just a primary school when I moved to my senior school the British school then Everything was forgotten, you know. I started living a completely secular life with my friends, just, you know, everything about parties and fashion and music and boys and da-da-da. And, you know, we never used to go to mass on Sundays. And did you notice that there was a big difference? Now you haven't got the nuns around you all the time. Was that something you noticed? Did, was there any part of it that you maybe honest, even missed? I was so excited about going to, to, to a British school with my English teachers and all that, that I, I, I just, I was so excited about actually moving 
to that school that I, I really didn't, you know, I didn't notice, yeah. Wow. Yeah. You had a good time, didn't you? I had a great time growing up. It was <laughs> wonderful. Now I look back, I'm a bit sorry that I didn't have Jesus in my in my life, you know. Now looking back, I, but at that time, I had a good time, <laughs> yeah. Did you have any relatives that maybe you, you, even if you look back now and say, they must have been praying for me or? My grandma, only from my mother's side. My grandma definitely, because she was a very pious lady, very pious. Uh, I remember praying the rosary with her when I was a little girl. You know, I, that, that's my, my, my memory. My grandma is she came to visit, you know, from Ecuador and praying the rosary with her. So, would you say by then in secondary school you've maybe lost your faith? Like it, it's yes, definitely, definitely, definitely. I, I still remembered, I still had a little, I still called myself a Catholic, of course. You know, we all did. Mm. <laughs> not, not. <laughs> How your hair? My hair is all over the place, so please help. <laughs> <laughs> Crazy wind, right? It is so windy. When did you move to England? When I was 17. I came here to take my A-levels and uh, it was very lucky that I ended up staying in this convent in Kensington oh. Square with the uh, Adoratrices, the um, nuns there. They have a convent. Are they still and, there? Uh, they're still there in Kensington Square. And that was a moment, a very short moment, when I sort of went back to being a Catholic because of course the, the, the nuns have got this chapel at the bottom of, at the on the uh, ground floor and adoration of the Blessed Sacrament so I didn't know that at that time but I must we were all protected in that house all the girls all of us and because of my friends they would say oh let's go to mass so I, I, I used to go to mass with them sometimes on Sundays as well and uh, I didn't have a confession I didn't so I wouldn't take the Blessed Sacrament I wouldn't take Holy Communion but at least I would go to mass and I, I felt that that was a short time I stayed there for about a year looking back it was definitely there was some sort of protection over all of us because we lived there. So we took the tube in the wrong direction. Across the underground station came a lovely lady who we'd not met before. She'd been watching the channel. Antonia, thank you for saying hi. And I just thought it was a lovely sign of how far-reaching the channel has become. And thank you all for joining us on this adventure. So that was quite a unique experience of England, really, but other, because um, my mum shares when she came to England, it, you know, there was a big culture shock, and maybe you saw that too. Yes, yes, I did, I did, huge. And so then from primary to secondary school, not such a difference, but from now, from South America, from yes. Lima yes. to England, yes. What did you yes. notice? Well, it was uh, very, very secular here, especially Christmas. Christmas shocked me. It was like Christmas, but without the actual spirituality, because even in Peru, you would, it was all about Jesus, the birth of Jesus Christ, you know, baby Jesus. Here, there was nothing. It was just about shopping, and I, I was really shocked. That shocked me, yes. So did you kind of buy into it and you sort of went along with it, but you were thinking, oh, is something wrong? Or was there anything you sort of tried to... Well, the first Christmas, I, I went back home. <laughs> and uh, and the second, my second Christmas was different because by then I had met Matthew. I met him just before I took my A-levels. Your husband, so, My yeah. husband. So then we got married within a couple of months. Yeah, it was crazy. So how old were you when you got married? I 18. Wow. So we just uh, we just went to the uh, we made an appointment at the uh, town hall and we went to a town hall and then we uh, in in on the King's Road and we got married there. So is Matthew from England? Yes, he's English. So he's and, like brought uh, up in the cult in our culture. Yes, yes. He did go to some Protestant schools when he was a little boy, but he wasn't baptized. So his parents had lost the faith completely as well, and uh, he wasn't even baptized in any Protestant, um, you know, religion. And um, and yeah, he he was completely well, a complete pagan really <laughs> when I met him. So your second Christmas, uh, it was spent with I think it was I cannot remember whether it was 
No, I think we did go back to Peru that Christmas. Yes, it was his first Christmas in a Catholic country. So he had the culture shock for the second Christmas. Yes. <laughs> well, he, for your first Christmas he, together. He spent some time in Peru before beforehand, uh, working as a journalist. That's how I met him. You see, I, I first met him in Peru when I was uh, when I was in school, basically. Hello. And uh, and he was working there as a journalist. So he had stayed in Peru. He knew about Peru, but he had he never spent Christmas there. But then the Christmas that shocked you was maybe your third Christmas. I think that it was my third Christmas. <laughs> my third Christmas. Yeah, we spent it with his family, and that was very very shocking because it was just so not religious at all. It was just like a family uh, get together. It was just that. It was all about presents and a family get together and. There was no talk at all of Jesus or anything, nothing at all. And yeah. this is you noticing, and you're not practicing yeah. your faith at all, you sort of haven't got any inklings to yeah. practice yeah. your faith, but yeah, Christmas was, was really... Yeah, I was completely lost, but I had some things that were sort of sacred, like Christmas or Easter, and, and all those things just sort of disappeared once I got married to Matt. And yeah. so being brought up in your family as well, which wasn't even, you know, you were yeah, described maybe as like cultural Catholic. Catholic. Yes, yes, that's right. That's right. And but you still notice. So do you think that the culture in Lima and like the celebrating all the feasts and seasons, that sort of thing, did at least help carry along? It does yeah. help, definitely. It helps. It helps a lot, definitely. Yes. And then, so you and Matthew married, you had... The two girls? Well, we, we were, for, for, for about nine years, we were just on our own, just having fun and not wanting to have children. And, yeah, it was a very sort of... It was awful, really, looking back. I mean, looking back, we had a wonderful time. But at the same time, it was bad spiritually for us, you know. So, so many years that we wasted when we could have been having children and being Catholics. Now looking back, it's like, you know, at that time it, it, it was all great fun, going on holidays, having fun, just the two of us. Yeah, of course, I now look at, you know, look back with great regret. <laughs> and so if you could go back and talk to yourself and just <laughs> gently coach yourself, what might you say? <laughs> and do you think you'd be convinced? I would, I would try and get this person back into Catholicism and back into going to church. If I could go back and talk to myself, yes. You know, that person that I was, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I would have found it hard, definitely, because when you are in that sort of world of secularism and fun and living for the, you know, carpe diem, enjoy the day and all that, it is, and you're young, when you're young, you're, you know, you're in your teens or 20s, you just want to have fun. But there was always that little seed of Catholicism inside me. So what brought you back, Lydia? then your girls yes. in this country yes and when they were born did you baptize them no I didn't I didn't um, we just thought we didn't even think about it to be honest and then when I started getting a little bit worried about it maybe we should have them baptized then I thought no I'm going to just let them 
grow up and find which religion they want to you know be and maybe they can they, they, they can be baptized when they're older when they want to when, when they decide whether they want to be Catholics or not that's what I thought mm. because at that time it was you know we we were sort of thinking maybe they might want to become Anglicans you know they're English and that's what I thought can you imagine Wow. I know, I know. <laughs> First of all, I thought, well, you know, in England people are Anglicans. I didn't really know anything. I was completely lost. I had lost the faith. I didn't even think that the Catholic religion was the one true faith, the only way to salvation, you know. So, so I, baptism was maybe just a signing up to something. I remember that at that time there was a lot of ecumenism, a lot of that talk going on in the church as well. We are all the same, we all have little truths. So, you know, with that sort of talk, if you're outside the church, <clears throat> there's no reason to join the church or to become, you know, a real Catholic. You know, we went through crazy phases with Matthew where we would have like a little Buddha, we would have Ganesh in our house, little... Yeah, no, we were uh, completely and totally lost. Just looking back, it was absolutely horrendous, you know, in the, the state we were in spiritually. Yeah. And did you feel to put your children in, your girls in Christian school, in a Catholic school? Oh, well, not really, no. I thought about perhaps the, um, the oratory for the little children, which is in Chelsea. At that time we lived in Chelsea, so I thought, well, it's really close and to us and everything. But then I heard that you, have to, you had to go to Mass every Sunday, and one of the priests had to say, yes, you know, they come to Mass, to Mass every Sunday. And then um, they had to be baptised, and that sort of put me off, because I thought, oh, there's so much work, I don't know how to do this, how do we... You know, do we even begin to get them baptised? And we don't have any Catholic friends. Wow. We just thought about all the negatives instead of the positives, and we were overwhelmed. And it was like, no, no, we can't be bothered. You know, let them just go to whatever, you know, anywhere, some, somewhere else, you know. And did you look back yeah. and think, oh, my primary school experience was really different? Did you share with them, like, oh, when I was a little girl, this is what we used to do, and we had this special mountain. You had a special mountain at your school when you were little. Yes, yes, I told you about it. It was this mountain where we'd go every 13th of May on a pilgrimage up, you know, walking all the way up with this big statue of the Virgin Mary at the top of it, and then we'd pray there. And it was a whole school. We all had to do it as a whole, as a school to pray to the Blessed Mother on the 13th of May. And, uh, but no, you know, I would, it, that was like buried. It was really weird. I couldn't remember anything of my childhood of, 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 of the, from before I went to my, uh, the, the British school, the secular school. I couldn't remember anything. It was all buried, buried. And then what about teaching them prayers? I did teach them the um, Our Father and the Hail Mary, so they did know how to pray, yes. But uh, they, they, they used to be so scared about the Hail Mary, the last bit, and in the hour of our death, <laughs> that I sort of, we had to change it a little bit for them at the hour to come. <laughs> <laughs> because they were like, Mommy, we don't want to say at the hour of our death. <laughs> I was like, OK, well, we're going to say the hour to come. It was not the ideal upbringing for children and, or, or the ideal situation, you know. And then was there never a time in their upbringing as well that you thought, OK, I've got a bit of space in my mind, maybe I can take them to Mass? Yes, it was when um, I started taking them to Mass when, I, when they were about, like, a, a six years old or something. Seven, you know, that sort of age, five. We had a little routine of going to, to Mass in the morning and then taking them for um, lunch, brunch at this place on the King's Road. And then um, we moved to Kensington, so it was very close to go to a Carmelite church and we would do the same thing. But yeah, it, so then. And would Matthew time. come along? Sometimes he would and sometimes he wouldn't. But because both of us, I, I knew in my heart of hearts that I, obviously I couldn't take the Holy Communion because I hadn't had a confession in years and years and years. So it was more just to be there. So yeah, there were times when we would come back to, the, when I would come back to a faith and bring the children there. And you know, there were, there were moments, moments of like light. When I look back at the, my whole life, it, I can really see the presence of God, you know, guiding me. 
even at the moments when I was in the deepest, darkest abyss, I, I can see him sort of gently, gently. <laughs> or it was the Virgin Mary picking me up. And so there were moments when I would sometimes think, well, let's go to Mass. We have to go to Mass. No, not at all. They were always very... Receptive. Yes, them. yes. I think one of the, my biggest regrets is that both of the girls were, I think, looking back, they were so spiritual. You know, they were so open to learning about God and about Jesus and about Catholicism. And I just didn't give them that. So that's a big regret I have. That when they were little, because sometimes on Christmas time, Christmas time, they would put on a little play and would be... Joseph or Mary and then they would have a little baby and so they would do those things and there was so much love there and I just didn't you know not enough I didn't teach them anything I didn't know anything I, I couldn't have taught them anything because I didn't know anything the little I knew when I that I learned when I was in um, in prep school had been forgotten yes I knew things like that I knew things like that I had stayed inside me I think my, my grandma must have prayed so much for, for all of us to be converted, not just for, you know, for the whole family, really. So when your girls were growing up and going through, so primary school is a bit more sort of sweet and innocent, and yes. then when they were going through secondary school, which they've only really just come out of, yes. um, was there anything that started to shock you or make you feel like, oh, this is really different? We, we stopped going to, to mass and all that, and we, we were very much steeped in sin, the whole family, all of us, without the church. You're on your own out there. That, that's how it is. So uh, the girls started, you know, they, start, they, they got um, Instagram, YouTube, all these things. And, and it was terrible because those things always make them think, uh, well, they, they just lead them to, to the wrong paths. You know, what do you find out there? You find a lot of feminism and the worst kind, you know, that says, oh, you know, you have to, it's all completely materialistic, completely about um, the way you look and, 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 and things like that, or having fun. One of the things that I'm extremely grateful about is that they never, ever got into drinking or partying with friends or taking drugs or anything like that which many of their friends did, and most of their friends did, and they would come back and say, our friends are doing this, and it's shocking because we don't want to do it. So even though they were very much influenced by, you know, the Kardashians and the whatevers, you know, all these people, they, they, they never really, um, they were never really very much into all that partying, which I thought was a blessing. Now, looking back, thank goodness, because they missed out on all that thing that, that children do. And it's really, it's big. It's, it's a huge problem. I don't get an impression of an unhappy marriage, unhappy home. You'd want to be around mum. Do you think that you've been kind of motherly and them loving you? Did that save them a bit? Despite everything, somehow we were very, very close, extremely close. The girls would always tell me, you know, they would open up and tell me things. They never hid anything too big from me. I mean, probably they had secrets, of course, they were teenagers. But we, were, we always moved as a little, like a little family, always. And I remember this lady told me once, you, you guys, you know, your family, you are like a jellyfish with many legs. You know, you move 
all of you are always moving together everywhere. And it, it, it's always been like that. Matthew always wanted, if it was just one, it, it had to be the four of us, you know, in everything. And, and that helped for the, for the conversion, definitely. That trust that the girls had in me. Because, of course, when one converts, it's such a huge, it's like an earthquake completely destroys your life before Christ and your, li your life is so completely different after Christ. So it's making me think of like a metaphor of the, the earthquake in Lima and everything was destroyed except for the mule of Jesus. And yes. it's interesting you're saying this kind of metaphor because yeah. there was like some tragedies and some huge challenges you faced yes, before yes. the conversion. Yes, there were very, very, very hard moments. I lost a baby and I, 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 I was in hospital for that. But because of complications with blood clots, I had blood clots all over the place. I stayed in hospital for a very long time. First of all, the miscarriage, then the blood clots. Then I finally came out of hospital. A couple of years later, a year later, I, I, I went back into hospital with, uh, with this terrible condition that I have, which is autoimmune hemolytic anemia, which my body starts destroying my own blood cells. So I get anemia and um, I, I just have to live with it. That's something that I live with. But about three years ago, it went really crazy and it really started just messing with my, with my body so, so badly that I landed, I, 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 I landed in hospital. And uh, they tried to cure me, but they couldn't. And they, they tried everything, even the harshest drugs. When I looked them up, Online, I couldn't believe it because they were drugs that would give you cancer. It was like, why am I taking something that's gonna give me can cancer to cure me from something else? It was just like, it was that bad. And lots of blood transfusions to keep me alive because my blood was going down, down, down to levels that were unacceptable and I was dying. And so this was really serious, like fatal. It was very serious, it was yeah. terrible. At first it was like, no, you're gonna be fine. The doctor said to me, don't worry, you're gonna be fine. But then as the weeks went by and they realized that everything was failing and I wasn't getting cured, they started sort of panicking. My parents started getting really worried. I didn't want my mom to get worried and my dad because they were so far away and it was really hard for the family. So how long did this go on for you in hospital? I was about there for just over four weeks. And before, you know, when, when, when things were getting really, really bad, my brother came over to visit me and he'd had a huge conversion a few years earlier and he, and, uh, he came to visit me and he said, look, you need to give your life to Jesus because otherwise, you know, we don't know what's going to happen. You just have to, you, ha you have to do it. You have to do it. And, um, and, and he talked to me about it and at first I was very offhand with him. I was horrible. The first time he came over, he actually, it's so hard for me to talk about this. I'm sorry. Don't worry, if, if anything, we can move on. No, it's fine. He, he left crying. And then he came back because I was in such a bad state. And the second time, I prayed with him, and I really felt something. I felt, I felt something so deep inside my heart. And then after he left, I prayed to, I prayed to the Lord God, and I said, please give me another chance. Don't let me die. I'm gonna be good from now on. Please give me another chance, God. And he gave me another chance, and he started getting better. And, and the doctors didn't know why I was getting, like, you know, they thought it was the drugs, but the truth is now for many, for at least two weeks, I had stopped taking the drugs. They were giving me the pills in the morning, and I was chucking them in the, in the bin because I had been so scared that, A, I was not getting better, and these drugs actually caused horrible illnesses like cancer. And, and I started getting better after that. That was the moment, the moment when I gave myself to, to, to God and, and, and He heard my cries.
being good mean? Like, how did you know what to do to be good? <laughs> you know what? When I was in hospital, I I, I suffered so much physically. Yeah. Because they they sometimes they run out of veins to um, put that thing into me. What's it called? The cannula. Uh, the cannula. And and they just tried everything and. I was pinched three times, ten times, it was ten times. It was ten, all the nurses tried, and then the doctors came, and at last this doctor was able to put the cannula in. They had to put cannulas here and there, and all sorts of things that I had to go through. So it was very, very painful. But all the time when I was going through that pain, I always said to God, Lord, that this pain may be for my that I may suffer and that my children may not suffer like I am suffering now. And when I left hospital, I felt really sort of cleansed. It was really, it was really strange. I felt like new. It was a very strange feeling, but I didn't know how to be good. I, I thought, well, I'm, I'm not going to lie. I'm going to try and obey the Ten Commandments and that's, what, and that's being good, right? That's what I thought. So I started doing that. Alice started taking her A-levels and she decided to do some politics. Uh, one of her A-levels was politics. We had been Brexiteers before that. We always wanted, we thought that nations are best when they are independent and they are not governed by, um, you know, supranational organisations. Each one to be governed by their own government. And it was through this activism, later on, like a year later, that suddenly we, I started moving into Catholicism. So what was the link? The link was that the more you study about the governments of the world and our government, and the more you get inside and, and deep, deep into politics, you realize that it's, it's just, it's, it's a horrible, it's a horrible world. It's completely demonic, completely satanic. And of course, you know, we can see that around us, abortion, euthanasia, we can see the fruits of that, of their ideologies. We, we are human beings, how can we fight Satan? <laughs> we cannot fight those powers. And then I thought, oh my goodness, of course, it's God, it's Jesus, he's the one. So that, you know, got, got me back into into um, religion and into the right path. It was thanks to YouTube, really, that I got into traditional Catholicism when I found the channel. And he started talking about traditional Catholicism and it was like, this is it. This is a way to fight what I'm trying to, what we're trying to fight in the secular world. It's one thing hearing these things and hearing like, yes, this is right, and wanting to fight. And then yes. what did that then look like in practice? Because well, in your practice, husband's not even baptised. No, and your no one is baptised. My girls were And this is you looking up by yourself? Secular. Yes, yes, yes. This is what's just by myself. Because at that point, of course, Alice and Beatrice were going to school. They were totally into the LGBTQ agenda, totally into it, into the gender thing. When I looked, I, was, I cried so much when I realized what had happened to my family. You know, I was like, Lord, please forgive me. Please help me. I realized my poor children, so steeped in sin with these horrible ideologies. They were pro-choice, pro-everything, you know, just completely 100%. And it was like, oh, this is going to be so big. How am I gonna do this? And I heard, pray the rosary, pray the rosary. I'm praying the rosary. <laughs> so I started praying the rosary at first because praying the rosary is a grace that you get from God. It's a grace that you get from the Blessed Mother. At first I could only do one decade. I could do, and, and, and praying that was like a big deal for me. And then I would pray one day yes, one day no, you know, when I could, a little bit more. One day I decided I'm gonna pray the whole rosary. Then I decided I'm gonna pray the whole rosary every day. Then I thought, my family is in such bad condition, I need to fast and I need to pray the rosary. <laughs> so I started fasting on Fridays and I started praying the rosary as many times as possible. So I would pray maybe once, twice, three rosaries a day. I, I started doing a whole uh, prayer of intentions before the rosary for the conversion of my family. I started fasting as many times as I could. If one day I felt like, okay, today I'm going to fast as well and I'm going to pray. So I started doing that and doing that, and little by little, 
at first they were very scared. My husband was terrified and my children were terrified too. He's like, what's happening to you? You're turning weird. <laughs> They and what, thought, what, what would they be noticing? I mean, maybe they, you're not having meals. But. They, they noticed that I was just, that I was saying strange things. And I was saying, no, you can't do that. No, this is not what God wants. No. And it was like, she's turning, she's, she's, my daughter Alice, who's very close to me, came up to me crying, saying, what's happening? I don't understand what's going on. Everything is changing. What's, what, what, what's going on? And it was just a moment of trust. I said, darling, you have to believe me. We need to become Catholics. We need to, and at the same time, the Lord was working on her because she started coming back from school and she started stopping at the local church, at the Carmelite church, and, and, and talking to God for the first, you know, for the first time. She started doing that. You know, she would tell me, I stopped today at the church and I was talking to God and I was like, wow. But she says to me now that every time she heard that the mass was about to start, she would run out of the church. So she couldn't go, she couldn't do the mass, but at least she was stopping there and she was talking to God and having some, a little bit of mental prayer. So many changes, little changes started happening in the family. And I think uh, um, it was the Lord or the Blessed Mother preparing us for, for the big changes that were ahead. That was about a year and a half after I came out of hospital. Like suddenly I got that grace to, uh, to actually see, you know, the, the blindfold came, up, came down. Wow. And suddenly I could see. And I saw what was happening to my family and I, I was horrified. I started praying the rosary and then in January, we went to mass, that's that Christmas day. We went to uh, mass and then um, that was it. Usually that would have been it. We would go to just one or two ma masses a, a, a year. And I thought from now on, we're going to go to mass, <laughs> to mass every Sunday. That's when I made the decision. In January, I got in touch with the Carmelite Church. I wrote a letter to the father and I said, this is what's happening. My husband and my daughters need to be baptized and I need to be confirmed and, and we need to get married the right way, you know, in the, in, in the eyes of God. And so with your husband, because the girls are obviously young and lovely and you're their mummy and, you know, they're, they're going with it maybe a bit more. Yeah. Husband, was it so easy for him? Yes and no. Yes, in the sense that, yes, he wanted to be part of it because, you know, we all have to do it together, right? That's his, his thing. Definitely, we all have to become Catholics and I am definitely going to do it as well. But at the same time, there was such a huge pull from from so many years of just living living a life of paganism and complete, you know, just me, 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 you know, like that sort of ideology. Yeah. It was very, very difficult for him to break those chains. Well, he could, it was the Blessed Mother, of course, who helped, helped him to break those chains for all of us, really. I had a chat with Beatrice the other day and she said to me, Mommy, you don't know how much I had to give up to become a Catholic. You know, I had to give up everything that I knew, everything that I thought was the right thing. She had to give that up. She had to give up her pro-choice pro ideologies. Do you think she resented it a bit at the time? Was it difficult? It was like she was sort of being carried along a little bit before? She was carried along, definitely a little bit. And it was just by the grace of God that she, little by little, those, those chains started breaking. At first, she just... She just went along because we all, she trusts in me and she thought, yes, we have to do this. You know, mommy wants us to do it, so let's do it. But little by little, she, she could see as well, you know, the blindfold came, came down, came off. So that was it. It was just the Blessed Mother working, working. I was just an instrument of God. And what, that's, that's one of my first prayers. I used to pray, please make me an instrument of your holy will, you know, when I started praying the rosary. So that was one of my prayers, and, and, and that's what happened.
with the girls started praying the rosary just after lockdown they started praying the rosary every day because I said okay now we pray the rosary every day we have to do it and then we started praying the rosary every day with the girls and that was a huge change and then Matthew little by little first some days yes some days no but then he also joined and um, lockdown was a, a, a time of great conversion for the family we used to um, go on online and watch you know like watch the mass every day well all from Walsingham from Walsingham yes the, the Grey Friars in Walsingham were incredibly important for our conversion of Our Lady of Walsingham you know when people say why Walsingham I don't know it just appeared on my YouTube channel on my YouTube it, it appeared and that was it, and it was Walsingham. Yes. So you'd not even known about Our Lady I didn't Walsingham? I not know about Our Lady of Walsingham or anything. It just appeared. So I thought, OK, we're going to, you know, to, to listen to, to, the, to, to these incredible friars who look so holy, so much reverence. I thought, this is beautiful. And, and we all, we, we were all catechized by the Grey Friars because their homilies are, are, are like catechisms in themselves. I wrote to, the, um, to Father Christopher Clark in January and he said, OK, come over. We had a little chat and then we started catechism straight away. When um, they lifted the lockdown, we got into the car and we went to Walsingham for the day. We went there just to, to visit and to pray in front of the Blessed Sacrament and to meet these incredible great friars who had, they, they didn't know, unbeknownst to them, they had guided us. It, it was a wonderful time, grace-filled, beautiful day. And a pilgrimage is a powerful thing, like, it is. you know, and maybe you're just thinking we're going to go and visit here for the day, but yeah. it changes us it and we get graces. It changes us. We did, we did a one-mile walk, yeah, the Holy Mile. We, it was a day of prayer and singing songs, and it was just gorgeous, and it was just us. And the most beautiful, the most wonderful thing was that Walsingham was empty. So it was wonderful to meet Monsignor John and all the all the friars, Father James Mary, Father John Delaney and Father Jared Mary here. Yeah. And then the first of January this year. Yes. Very special day. All three of them got baptized and they received the Holy Communion and con they got confirmed and everything this January, January the first. Three baptisms, three holy communions, four confirmations and one wedding. <laughs> Congratulations. Yes, yes. So that they're on fire with the faith, are they kind of testing yes, the waters? Yes, it's all four of us. We just all came back into the faith. And Matthew as well. Matthew as well. He knows that he is the head of the family and that he needs to, you know, fight for us. He needs to be a strong, stable head of the family so that he can protect the whole family. I think the hardest thing is just to completely break with your former life. Like not being able to hang out with the people you used to hang out with uh, or be friends with your friends or, you know, listening, listening to music that you used to listen to or things like that. Well, I am a little bit, <laughs> I'm a little bit strict, strict sometimes in things like that, but only with myself. I, I never push anything. I say, look, God would like this, but it's up to you and you move at your own pace. Our conversion is a story that is for the, that really shows the glory of God and what he can do to a completely pagan secular family and, and to convert us all. It's just a grace, a grace from, from God. It was a grace from God. It's a bit of a long story, but it was just that. Can we hear about it another day? Yes, yes. Please mind the gap between the train and the platform. Exit here.